Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Pavel Gabrikovsky, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Wrocław. Uh, before that, I studied there, and I participated in the ISPC competition. So my team was the first team from Wrocław to advance to the finals, uh, and we got the fifth place, which was really great. Um, and after that, I'm, I was still involved with, uh, in preparation of other teams. So every now and then, I get a new mascot from the finals. <laughs> Uh, but uh, my main job is uh, research, um, and actually ICPC is one of the reasons for why I went to research. So, of course, you can do many other things after after having competed in ICPC, but uh, academia is one of them. Uh, so, I would like to show you what we do. So, it'll be a mix of our lecture and our research talk. Um, about uh, recent progress on global minimum cut, I will spend some time introducing the problem and giving you the history, which is quite long. Uh, and then I will talk about a paper that I had with uh, Shai Moses and Torin Weiman uh, about this uh, problem. Okay, so let me start by defining the, the problem you want to solve. Uh, I think you have all seen it before, but just in case. So we are given a graph. It's undirected edge weighted graph. Mm, the weights are positive. Uh, you can think real numbers or real integers. It doesn't really matter in this case. Mm. And we want to partition uh, the nodes of the graph into two parts. Uh, one of them is S and the other is the complement of S. And you want to choose this partition as to minimize the total weight of edges that cross the partition. So one endpoint is in S and the other endpoint is not in S. Okay, so those blue edges in the figure. Uh, and the goal is to choose S as to minimize this total cost. Mm. So if this were an ICPC problem, uh, you would probably immediately apply a maximum flow algorithm. Mm. So you know the minimum count maximum flow theorem. Uh, so if you know one node in S and one node in the complement of S, you just compute maximum flow between those two nodes and this will give you the uh, minimum count. Uh, the problem is that you don't really know which nodes are in S and which are not in S. Mm, so probably you would have to try all pairs of nodes. So it, you would have many invocations of maximum flow algorithm, which is uh, maybe a bit slow. And when you think a little bit, you can see that actually you only need n minus one uh, such invocations. So you fix one node and you say that this is in S and then you try um, all other nodes as, as the possible node not in S. So you have n minus one maximum flow computations. And now you plug in your favorite maximum flow algorithm and hopefully it's accepted. Okay, but what's the complexity of such approach? Mm, the fastest maximum flow algorithm that we have uh, works in n times m time, okay? So that's quite high, you, you, you run it n times uh, and you will have n squared times m. So is there something faster? It's a very basic problem. So people look at it a long time ago and they tried, uh, tried to come up with something more efficient. And in 94, there was a paper by Howard and Orlin and roughly speaking, they, they show that you only need to run a single maximum flow computation. It's not that simple. So, so but, but the running time is uh, equal to the running time of a single maximum flow computation. So it's M times N times some log factor. Mm. So it uses blocking flow essentially. Okay, so that's better, but it's still uh, M times N. Mm. And actually even before that, there was a different approach uh, in anti 2 by Nagamoch and Tibaraki they had this very cute observation or theorem that uh, in almost linear time, n plus n log n time, you can either find the global minimum cut, so you'll find the answer, or you will, you will figure out two nodes u and v and uh, with the property that they're not separated. So they're both on the same side of the global minimum cut. And in such case, you can contract this pair of nodes. So you just glue them together and you continue. So we'll have n iterations of this process and each of them is like almost linear time, n plus n log n time. So it gives you a quite simple, very beautiful algorithm of running in m times n plus n squared log n time. So I don't have time to describe exactly how to find this pair of nodes. It, uh, it's very nice. Okay, mm, this is still uh, quite high, especially if the graph is dense. Mm, so for dense graphs, there was a better solution by Karger and Stein from 96. It's actually an improvement of a previous algorithm by Karger. So it used some kind of randomized contraction. So you, you choose an edge at random and then you contract it and you repeat this process. Um, so the original algorithm by Kager was like uh, n squared times m and then there was an improvement. Uh, it's a bit more technical, but they, they were able to solve this problem in n squared times uh, a few logs uh, with high probability. 
So it's a randomized sample. OK, that's great. If the graph is dense, uh, that's close to, to optimal. Mm. But what if your graph is sparse? So what, what's the best, best you can hope for for sparse graphs? So in 96, there was a very nice paper by Kager. Mm. He showed that for sparse graphs, there is a better solution uh, that works in m times slope to the power of 3. That solves the problem with high probability. With high probability means that there is a small chance that the algorithm will return an incorrect answer, but it's a very small uh, probability and you, you have some control on how large this probability is. So you can run it multiple times and there's a very small chance that you will get an incorrect answer. And I will describe this framework because all the subsequent papers uh, operate in the same framework. So it will take me some time to introduce how exactly he managed to do this. It's a very nice uh, method. So his idea was that uh, the original problem is very hard to solve. I mean, it's not clear how, how to figure out this new cut. So let's reduce it to a problem in which we are given some kind of a hint about the, how this global medium cut looks like. And this hint mm, has the following shape. So you are given a spanning tree of your graph. You are given a spanning tree T, and you are given a parameter K. The K will be one or two. And we are promised that exactly K edges of this tree cross the minimum cut. OK, so for almost all edges of this tree T, uh, both endpoints are on the same side. Just, just this one edge crosses the cut, or two edges cross the cut. So I will show you a figure just to make sure. So this is the tree T. Uh, we choose any node to be the root. It's, it's not important, but it's always the same node being the root. Mm. And in this case, you are promised that exactly one edge cross the cut. So this blue edge cross the cut. And then you know what's, what's S. Right, because the, the subtree rooted at the lower endpoint of E is S, and what's outside is not S. So that's for K equal one. And for K equal two, you are given two edges, and they, together they also determine the S. So in this case, S is uh, between those two edges. Yeah, so it's the subtree of E without the subtree of E prime. Okay, so his idea was to somehow reduce the, the original question to a few, not too many instances of this new question where given a hint. So there will be logarithmic number of uh, smaller instances. OK, uh, that's great. But how do you figure out uh, those trees? I mean, it doesn't really seem simpler. And no one is going to give you those trees for free. So uh, we want to think about spanning trees. Uh, we'll find some uh, material property of spanning trees. And for the time being, let's let's say that the graph is actually undirected. Uh, and let's say that the minimum cut uh, is C. Of course, we don't really know C, but for the time being, let's, let's assume that we do. And now let's let's think about, um, about a spanning tree. Um, so how many edge disjoint spanning trees you can have at, uh, in your graph? So you, you want to choose a collection of trees, spanning trees of G, but each edge can be used at most once. So how many how many trees you can uh, you can find? So when you think about it for a few seconds, the answer is uh, at most C. And this is because you have minimum cut, so you have this partition of the graph into two parts, S and the complement of S. And each spanning tree spans everything, so it needs to cross from S to the complement of S. So each spanning tree needs to eat at least one of the C edges in the minimum cut, and you have only C edges. So this can be repeated at most C times, okay? So there is some nice connection between the minimum cut and uh, packing, it's called packing uh, spanning trees. But this is one direction. So we know that we can pack at most C spanning trees. With more effort, one can show that actually there is a connection in both directions. So there is some theorem, an old theorem by Nash Williams from 61, and it was also proved by Tat uh, independently uh, a few years earlier. And they show that if you have a unweighted graph uh, with minimum cut C, then you can all you can always find there always exists a collection of C over two edge disjoint spanning trees. So when you think about packing edge disjoint spanning trees, then you can always find at least C over two of them, and at most C. You can never find more than C. Okay. Uh, and actually, they wanted to consider something slightly different at the minimum cut. So this is um, a consequence of the main theorem of Nash Williams. And now why this is helpful at all. So when you think about it, let, let's say that you, you have those C over two edge disjoint trees. Then the average number of edges from the minimum cut is two. Yeah? Because you have C edges of the minimum cut and they, they are distributed among the spanning trees. 
uh, each tree needs to take at least one uh, edge and uh, C edges overall. So then it means that for at least one tree from your collection of spanning trees, uh, you have this nice property that this tree, one or two respects um, constraints the minimum cut. And you can use this tree as, as this hint. Okay, so there is some connection um, between uh, spanning trees and the minimum cut. And uh, this shows that indeed there exists uh, this tree that can be used as a hint, but it's an existential theorem. So you have to find those trees. So it's not so easy to apply this idea. And the main problems that he had to solve is that first of all, he wanted, uh, he wanted weighted graphs. So the weights on the graphs, you have to generalize this theorem to weighted graphs. Okay, you can do this problem. Mm, but when you do this, then um, the minimum cut, the value of C might be actually very large. It could be much larger than M and N. And uh, on the previous slide, I said that we, we look at C over two spanning trees. So it's not clear whether it's polynomial at all. Uh, and it's not clear how to find those trees. Um, so somehow you have to figure out how to do this. And finally, if you're able to do this, then uh, you still need uh, an efficient procedure for finding the minimum one and two respecting cut. So that's the last step of this uh, reasoning. Okay, so because we want weighted graphs, uh, we want to introduce this concept of weighted tree packing. So it's a set of spanning trees in the in your graph, and each tree has its weight. Um, let's let's say a positive real number. And the property is that you want to maximize the total weight of all the trees in your in your weighted tree packing. But at the same time, if you think about any edge in the graph, then the total weight of all trees in the packing should be at most uh, the weight of the of the edge. So you you want to pack as many mm, trees as possible in formally speaking, but now it's all weighted. Okay, and now his, his approach was as follows. So first of all, um, he, he takes the graph G and he, he's producing a new graph H that's unweighted uh, in almost linear time. And the, the properties of H is that first of all, there are not too many edges in H, only n log n, so it, it's much sparser possibly. And the minimum cut in H is only log n. So you start with a graph with maybe a very large minimum cut, and now the minimum cut is very small. But at the same time, if you think about the minimum cut in the original graph G, and you take this partition into S and the complement of S, and you compute its value as a cut in the new graph, it's uh, not too bad. It's seven over six approximate minimum cut. So informally speaking, you take your graph G, you produce a new graph, it's called uh, skeleton because it's kind of sparse and it still kind of captures some information about uh, the original new graph. Then he, he applied some known algorithm uh, to find that tree packing in H. Uh, so there's an algorithm by Plotkin, Schmidt, and Tardosh, and it's an approximate uh, algorithm, so it will not find the best possible tree packing, but it will find one that's not, not too, too bad. And it's very efficient, so it's uh, n log q of 10. And then the final uh, and very nice observation is that when you think about this tree packing, it's a weighted tree packing, mm, and you think about the minimum cut in G. So again, this is a uh, packing in H, but H has some connection to G. And now if you do some simple, simple manipulation with numbers, uh, it turns out that out of all trees in this packing, a large fraction, one over 10 of them, mm, is one or two respected by the minimum cut. Okay, so you find this collection of trees, it's a weighted collection, and then the total weight of all trees that are good for you, that can be used as a hint for finding minimum cut in G, is at least one over 10. And this requires some easy calculation. Uh, okay, you can see the calculation, let's not go through this in detail. So why, why this is nice? Well, so this is nice because you have, uh, assuming that you, you have this weighted tree packing, and by applying this non algorithm, you can assume that, you know that uh, one over 10, uh, of the trees uh, uh, as are useful to you. You don't know which ones. So you could either tree all of them, it's maybe a bit slow, uh, but because it's a large fraction, you just sample at random. Uh, and by repeating log n times, you will obtain log n trees. And with high probability, uh, one of the trees in, that you have sampled can be used as a hint. Uh, so you know that the minimum cut will, will run or to respect um, one of the trees in your farm. Okay. Um, so there's some technical details. In particular, finding this this graph H is a bit technical. The, the high level idea is that you, when you have a weighted edge, mm, you replace it by a bunch of unweighted edges, mm, and then you do some random sampling that depends on the value of C. So it seems a bit weird at first to find C. You need to know the value of C, 
uh, but it's actually okay because you can use some approximation. So the first step of the whole algorithm is to approximate the value of C, and there were some known algorithm for doing that. Okay, mm, if I lost you, then the bottom line is that uh, in uh, very efficiently, we can find log entries, and one of them uh, is useful for us. It can be used as a hint. So the minimum cut will one or to respect this tree, okay? And this is just, just as a reminder, that's what that's mean, it means to, uh, to respect. So now we can focus on the new problem. And this is what Carger did. So first he observed that one respecting is very easy. So, and you can see it, I think, in a few seconds. So you, you want to find edge E in T that minimizes the total weight of all edges that cross the, the cut. So one endpoint is in the subtree of E and the other is not. So those are the green edges. They stick out of the subtree of E. Uh, and we will try all edges E one by one. And for each of them, we want to know this value. Uh, so when you think about this in the other direction, you take one of the green edges. Those are the edges of G. And this green edge should contribute to all edges E on the path between the endpoints. So with LCA queries, you can figure out what, what's the path and then you just accumulate this information by traversing T1s. So if a constant time LCA queries is very easy to do in O of M time. Okay, so that's, that's very efficient. Two respecting is uh, more annoying. First of all, you have two cases. Uh, the first case is called independent edges. So E and T prime are in the figure. You can, I think, uh, see what I mean by independent. Uh, and then there is the case of descendant edges. So again, you can see what I mean in the figure. So his approach for both cases was roughly the same. Um, and it was based on some kind of recursive decomposition of the tree. I think all of you are familiar with heavy path decomposition or maybe centroid decomposition. So he used a different decomposition that's uh, not, not that popular. It's called uh, Bauf's uh, decomposition. It's, uh, it, it's, it's something used in parallel uh, algorithms uh, for contracting things. Uh, it operates in log n phases and something's happening in those phases. I don't want to describe this. Um, inside each phase, you get to use link up trees. And link up trees take log n time per operation. There were log n phases and m operations in each phase. So the outcome was that the running time was m log squared n. And again, the algorithm was, was randomized. So with high probability, it returns the correct answer. And high probability means one minus one over n. Okay, so this is m log squared n mm, times one log because you have log n trees. So it's m log cubed in the end. And then he uh, he asked if it's possible to solve this question faster. And actually he, he gave two hints uh, about what might work. Uh, the first hint was that maybe you don't need to link up trees because the tree actually doesn't change. So maybe you are using this big hammer for nothing. Uh, and then maybe you, this decomposition is not the right one. Maybe there's some, some better decomposition because again, it's doing a bit more than what uh, you want to do. Okay, but the paper was in 96 uh, and no one was able to uh, use those hints. Uh, um, okay. Uh, but then there was some, some very interesting development. Um, so the, this whole framework is randomized. So it's very important that you, you do this random sampling. It's, it's uh, not clear how you could avoid that. Um, and uh, in 2017, there was an algorithm, quite efficient algorithm, uh, deterministic for simple unweighted graphs. Okay, so there are no weights and you have no parallel edges. And it's actually an improvement of the previous paper that was a bit slower. And then it was improved, uh, the running time was improved, but again, it was for simple and weighted. So simple and weighted seems um, a bit easier and we, we don't need randomization. Okay, and then there was a paper by uh, Lovett and Sandland. Um, they solved the two respecting problem. So the case when you seek two edges in T, but instead of linked trees, they use top trees, which is some other structure. And instead of uh, doing this bulk decomposition, they used the standard heavy light decomposition. So it was a simpler algorithm, but the running time was the same. M log squared per tree, some M log cubed. Okay, so, but it was simpler. It used more standard tools. Uh, and finally, there were two papers, uh, one by myself and uh, Shai Moses Moder um, And we showed that actually you can solve the two respecting problem in M log N time. Uh, so this gives you M log squared time, 
by using Hager's framework with high probability. And there was another paper uh, by uh, Mukhopathai and Analkai. Uh, it was independent, and they solved the two respecting problem in m log n plus n log cubed n. Okay, so it's still m log n, but uh, if the graph is sparse, then it's a bit worse because it's um, uh, three logs. Mm, and it was randomized. The two respecting problem was solved uh, in, with randomized self. So I will talk about the first uh, algorithm. The second one is also interesting, but I don't have time to present. Okay, uh, so our main contribution is that we solve this two respecting problem in m log n time, but it's actually not enough to uh, achieve an improvement because there was this preliminary step where we had to find the skeleton graph and we also had to approximate C. So we have to kind of redo all those steps and make sure that they work in m log spread and time. I will not talk too much about uh, that. Okay, but the, the bottom line is that we can solve new cut in m log squared uh, and time with high probability. So this is the outline of the of the faster sampling. So I will just mention some keywords without uh, without uh, explaining details, so you can check later how it works. So first, we need to approximate the minimum cut, and there is a constant factor approximation by Matula. We, we have to show how to implement it efficiently because it was not needed for the previous algorithm, but now we are getting very close to, <laughs> to linear, so, so it's a bit more annoying. Then uh, we contract edges that are too heavy, and the others are treated as a bunch of parallel unweighted edges. Then we do some random sampling. This random sampling needs to be implemented efficiently. So it's uh, also again, a bit annoying. And then to find the tree packing, we use this Lagrangian packing technique. It's a um, bit uh, technical to explain, but there, are, there is a bunch of iterations and in each iteration you need to find the minimum spanning tree. So it's not hard to implement actually. Uh, and the, the number of iterations is log squared n. Uh, in each of them, we use linear time minimum spanning tree. So overall, it's m log squared n. Okay, mm, and now we have a bunch of trees. We have log n trees. Mm, it took us m log squared n time to get there. Uh, and we know that the minimum cut one or two respects one of those trees. Okay, so now what do we do? So we consider all those trees one by one. We know that one of them is, uh, is a good hint, but we don't know which one. And the first step is that we want to find the minimum of one respecting cut. And Karger showed how to do this in O of M time. So there is nothing to do. Then we have to solve the dependent case. So the case when uh, one edges are in the subtree of the other. And I will show you how to do this in M log N time. It's a bit simpler than the other case. Uh, and the main technical part is, is the other case, the case of independent edges. So our solution consists of two steps. Uh, so we will introduce new problem to make our life simpler. We call it the bipartite problem. It will have even more structure. And the reduction to this problem takes m log n time. Mm, the total size of, the, of those new problems will be O of m. So we are not losing too much as a constant factor. And then we show that if you have this new problem, uh, an instance of this new problem of size S, you can solve it in S log S time. And I will show you how those steps uh, work. So this sums up to M log squared. And again, it's randomized because of the first step where we do random sample. And we use Karger's framework. It seems very hard to avoid it. Okay, so what to do with the dependent edges case? We use linked trees. Mm, I think you all know linked trees. So you have heard about them. Um, and actually, we need a small set of uh, operations. So we maintain a tree. The tree doesn't really change. Uh, only the weights of the edges change. One operation is that we want to add delta to all scores on a path. So we, we specify two endpoints and we want to increase the score by delta. Delta could be negative. So sometimes we add, sometimes we subtract. And the query is that given a, a node, given a subtree, you want to find the edge with the smallest current score in this subtree. Okay, so those are two operations. You can implement them with linked trees in log n time, but also the other ways you could implement this log n time, but linked trees are maybe the, the easiest uh, to describe. So now the algorithm for the dependent edges case is as follows. First of all, um, we want to assume that T is binary. So each node has a, at most two treatment. Uh, it doesn't really have to be the case, but you can always uh, subdivide nodes. So you, when you have a node with high degree, you just uh, create like virtual nodes and you modify G and T. So you can assume that the tree is binary. 
And then we sweep over the edges of the tree of T um, using the Euler tool. So, so we go around the tree uh, and we maintain some kind of scores in the linked tree. So this is T. Uh, and when we reach H E, uh, we want the following invariant to hold. So we reach E, and at this point, we want to find H E prime that together with E give you, gives you the, the best possible, um, the, the cheapest cut. So in the, var in the invariant, it should be that for each E prime in the subtree of T, the weight of the cut defined by those two edges together by E and E prime is the current score of E prime plus the total weight of all edges with exactly one endpoint in T E. So those are the green edges from one of the previous figures. And the second value is computed anyway for the one restricting case. Uh, so you just query your link at tree for the edge E prime with the smallest score in the subtree. Uh, and then you add that this, this predetermined value that you have computed earlier for E. So I don't want to show you how to maintain this invariance, but uh, when you think a little bit, you can figure it out. Uh, it's important that the invariant holds only for the edges E prime in the subtree of E. For the other edges, the, the scores, uh, they don't really correspond to, let's say, the, the independent case. Okay, so overall it's one sweep over the edges of E. And for each edge of the graph G, uh, you issue a constant number of updates to the linked tree. Uh, so at, essentially at the LCA of the endpoints. And for each node of the tree, for each edge E, you issue one query to the linked tree. So it's M log N over. Okay, so this used standard tools and we are done. So for the other case, we'll have to think a bit more. So uh, I want to introduce this new problem. Uh, we call it the Barpetite problem. And in this problem, uh, you actually given two trees, T1 and T2, okay? And additionally, you are given a bunch of uh, cross edges. So cross edge has one endpoint in T1 and the other in T2, so those are the green edges in the figure. Um, and each, each edge of T1 and T2 also has its own weight or cost. Okay, so that's the input of the problem. Uh, now, what's the what's the goal? So you find you want to find e from t1 and e prime from t2 that minimize the following: the sum of the cost of e1, uh, the sum of the cost of e plus the sum of cost of e prime minus the total weight of all cross edges that connect nodes in those two subtrees. So. Uh, those green edges, uh, one endpoint is in the subtree of E and the other endpoint is in the subtree of E prime. And you want to subtract the cost of those green edges. Okay, and now you, you want to find E and E prime as to minimize the, uh, this expression. Okay, but why, what's the connection, the original question? Why, why, why do we care about this? Um, so it's not hard to, 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 to um, reduce the original question of uh, independent edges to the new problem. Uh, it's a bit harder to do this efficiently. So let's let's first think how why why there is a connection. Okay, so let's think about E and T prime. They are independent in T. And now they have LCA, right? It's the node X. So X has two children. It's two LCA, so it can't have just one child. Uh, so we will have a separate instance of this new problem for a node X. And this new instance should capture E and T prime. Uh, so if if the LCA of E and T prime is X, then uh, the answer for the, for the new problem obtained for the node X should give you the answer to that question. And now you can see that it's a little bit like this Bapatat problem, yeah, because X has two children. So you can think about the left subtree and the right subtree, and that's really two trees. Uh, you have a bunch of cross edges that are the edges of G that connect those two subtrees. Uh, so let's think about this in more detail. So this is the LCA. And now you seek uh, E and T prime. E should belong to the left subtree. E prime should belong to the right subtree. And the weight of the cut that they together define uh, is as follows. So we have a bunch of those green edges that connect uh, the subtrees. So when, when you write down the formula for the cost of the um, uh, cut that they define is the total weight of all edges with one endpoint in the subtree of E plus the total weight of all edges with one endpoint in the uh, subtree of E prime. Uh, and then you, you kind of double count the, the edges uh, that connect those two subtrees because they, they, are not, they don't cross the cut actually. So you have to subtract the total weight of all edges that connect those two subtrees. And this is really the definition of the Bapatat problem, but uh, you just have to remove X to have two subtrees. 
Okay, uh, but there's a problem with this approach. It's not really efficient. Uh, when you think about uh, a tree that's not very balanced, then uh, the total size of all instances of this new problem would be quadratic because for each node with two children, and that could be all nodes, almost all nodes, you take the left subtree and the right subtree, and uh, this sums up to quadratic. So it's not what you want to do really if you want uh, m times a number of locks. So here is the main trick that's very simple. Uh, so even if those two subtrees are large, uh, most of their edges don't really matter, okay? So if we denote by S the number of cross edges with LCA equal to the current X, only all of S edges matter. And let me show you why. So this is the subtree of X. Uh, and then you have the endpoints of those cross edges, okay? Uh, so this, is, this is like the left subtree of X. And the, the green nodes are the left endpoints of the cross edges. And they span this induced subtree. And on some of those uh, paths, you might have many nodes that are not really an endpoint of an cross edge. And I claim that in such case, among many edges on this path, you only need to keep the cheapest edge because in the end, you minimize the sum of costs. Okay, so when you have a long path here and uh, nodes are not green on this path, you just keep one edge. So you kind of contract long paths. And then the number of those green nodes is S. So it's not hard to see that you, you will be able, you don't need to keep two, at most two S edges, O of S edges. You need to think how to figure out uh, which edge is the cheapest and how to kind of reconstruct this shape efficiently. So this you can do with some LCA queries uh, and path minimum queries. For, for, for this, we have very efficient uh, solutions. Uh, Logan is for sure enough, uh, but you can you could solve this faster, but there is no need for that. So in S log n time, you will kind of sparsify those two subtrees. And now you have two subtrees of size O of S. So overall, uh, this sums up to uh, O of M. So this is what it prompts. Okay, but now you have to solve this new problem. So we reduced our original problem to a new problem, but how do you solve this new problem? Uh, so again, the, the setting is that you have two trees, T1 and T2, um, and you want to find E from T1 and E prime from T2 that together uh, optimize your, your, your function. So it's the sum of the cost of E1 uh, of E plus the sum of cost of E prime uh, minus this total weight of edges uh, that connect the subtrees. So actually we will do a, a bit more um, because sometimes uh, in other applications, it's better to, to solve a more general question. So for each edge of T1, we will find the, the best edge of, e, uh, of T2. So for each edge of T1, we will find the edge uh, of T2 that uh, minimize this expression. And in the end, we will just uh, compare all those possibilities. So uh, for each E, we have the, the best possible E prime, and we will look at all edges E in T1. So now the idea is that, that we will do some kind of divide and conquer algorithm, and we will use the heavy light decomposition of T, T1. Uh, so I'm not defining heavy light decomposition because I assume you have seen it. Uh, in this divide and conquer, um, we operate on, on what we call fragments of T1. Okay, so this whole game is on T1. We start with the, with the whole T1, and then we look at smaller and smaller fragments of T1. A fragment is defined by two nodes. U1, and you take the subtree of U1 without the subtree of one of the descendants UK. In particular, a fragment could be the whole subtree of uh, U1, but uh, at further stages of the algorithm, you have those fragments, okay? And you start with the whole T1. Um, yeah, so you have U1, UK, they, they connect with something that, uh, we call a spine, and there are things kind of hanging off, dangling from this spine, uh, it's the fragment. And the input to each uh, recursive step is such a fragment of T1. Okay, and now uh, using the heavy light decomposition, uh, you start with one fragment and you kind of chop it into smaller fragments and again and again and again. If you do this carefully, the depth of the recursion will be log n, and on each level of the recursion, the fragments will be disjoint. Uh, so the total size of the subtrees of T1 uh, will be small. Okay, so this is how you control what's happening with T1. But with T2, uh, so far I haven't done anything. So it seems that in every recursive call, I would be uh, passing the whole T2 and that's again quadratic. So that's not what you want to do. But it turns out that we can use the same trick. 
of, of kind of sparsifying uh, the tree. So let's let's think about a fragment. So this is one of the fragments. It's rooted at U1 and it stops at UK. This is one of the heavy paths. So the fragments always look at that and there are things hanging off this heavy path. So this gray area is the current fragment. And now this is T2, okay? And we are only interested in the cross edges between the, the fragment and T2. So those are the cross edges. And we apply the same trick. So we sparsify T2. We take the subtree induced by the right endpoints of the cross edges, and we, we sparsify it by keeping only the cheapest edge on each path. Uh, so now we have, instead of the whole T2, we have this green, green tree that's much smaller. And for technical reasons, we have to attach an extra root. Uh, we'll not define exactly how to do the specification, but it should be intuitively clear that you don't uh, need to keep all the edges. So if you can do this, uh, then for uh, whenever we have a fragment, um, then uh, you have a compressed representation of the interesting part of T2. So it's not really a subtree of T2, it's some kind of presentation of the interesting edges from T2. And its size is always, always bounded by all of the size of the, of the fragment, uh, where the size is the number of cross edges. So uh, now by controlling the size of the fragment, you can also control uh, the size of the subtree of T2 that you have to worry about. Okay, and this has to be maintained. Uh, so in every step of the recursion, you have the current fragment of T1 and a compressed presentation of the relevant part of T2 um, of size O of S, where S is number of cross edges in the fragment. Um, okay, and then um, we split the current fragment into smaller fragments. I will not explain how to do this exactly, but uh, it's a divided the power. So you split into at most three sub problems. Uh, you take this fragment and you replace it by smaller fragments. Uh, you remove uh, a few edges, constant number of edges. So for those, you find the answer naively by going through the whole compressed presentation of T2. Uh, then the remaining part is partitioned into a constant number of smaller fragments. And for each smaller fragment, you need to prepare this compressed presentation of the relevant part of T2. So you kind of compress the, uh, the compressed presentation. So you keep extracting this information from the previous presentation. And then when you make sure that the depth of the recursion is uh, log n, uh, the running time of this whole uh, procedure uh, is m log n because the, the fragments are disjoint and the sizes sum up to m at each level. Okay, there are some technical uh, details here. I don't want to describe in, in particular, you have to actually describe two separate compressed presentations. Overall, it's not, not too hard, but I don't have two hours. So I, you're not going to spend this little, you can see the paper. Okay, uh, Okay. so this is our algorithm. Uh, so to summarize, we can solve the minimum cut in m log squared n time with high probability. So the first step is randomized and we obtain a collection of log n trees in m log squared n time. And with high probability, one of those trees will uh, one or two uh, constrain the minimum cut. So that's the only source of randomness. And then for each of the log n trees, we run our procedure that takes m log n time per tree. So that's m log squared n time. The other algorithm uh, is quite different. Uh, it, it's also in the framework of Carger. So there is this skeleton step and the specification step, and then there is a bunch of trees, uh, but then they solve the co two constraint problem differently. Uh, they notice that there is some structural property, uh, very nice structural property of the minimum cut when you look at different edges E and T prime. And, there, um, and then you can form some matrices and something called uh, Monge property shows up. Um, but in the end, the, the time is slightly worse because they, they pay n log cubed n for each tree. Okay, so the obvious questions uh, that maybe you will like is that first of all, is there something faster? So there is some, still some slack. Maybe there is a way to solve this in M log n time without going too far from Kager's framework. I don't think you can get below M log n uh, unless you do something completely different. But yeah, here it's uh, maybe it's possible. And actually we have a new paper on archive that shows that if, if your graph is dense, then there is a faster algorithm. So when, uh, when M is at least N to 1.0001, there is something faster, so you can check that. It's based on the idea from the other paper. Mm -hmm. And then for deterministic algorithm, you need a completely different approach. Uh, so we know how to do this for simple unweighted graphs, but it's, uh, 
it's an extremely interesting question. Can you do something for uh, general weighted graphs, it, even if it's not uh, new linear? You, it would be still interesting if it's m times some small function. Okay, uh, that's all. So hopefully it was not too boring. Uh, so thank you for your attention. <laughs> Okay, so thank you everyone. And I hope to see some of you uh, in some ICPC competitions uh, this year or next year and bye-bye.